Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, I'll be looking at The National System of Political Economy by Friedrich List. I've mentioned this book a couple times in previous episodes. It was published in 1841 and uh, was an important contributor to uh, the ideas that went into the American system. Friedrich List was a German-American. He was born in Germany, but he kind of went back and forth between Germany and the United States. I don't think it was too long after he wrote this book that he came down with a terrible and painful illness and ultimately took his own life. I think his illness was terminal and, uh, and unpleasant, and so... He made the decision to take his own life, but uh, before he did, he published this excellent work and contributed a lot to economic thought and his to the extent that his ideas contributed to the American system and the American system contributed greatly to American prosperity, uh, I think we could say that we owe a lot to Friedrich List for the work that he did in in promoting protectionist economic policies. So this book is, uh, you know, it's old. Uh, It's, it's, like I said, 1841. And I think economics hadn't really developed to the state that it's in today. Um, It's interesting because this book doesn't really have what we would now... Uh, in the modern era, I think, consider hard economics. There's, let's see, there's four components to this. There are four books in here that are combined in one. The first book is called The History. The second is called The Theory. The third is called The Systems. And the fourth is called The Politics. Uh, I'm only going to read some sections from The Theory, the second book. Uh, But I will read, I think I have six sections to read. And because I'm looking for, you know, the theory of protectionism, I'm looking for some explanation as to specifically why it works and how it works. Uh, I don't get that from this book as much as I would like to, uh, but I think it's just because of the era in which it was written. So there's theory, but there's not really crisp, clear theory. Um, The history section is interesting. Uh, It's all interesting, but I want to try to extract as much as I can, uh, try to extract a a nice coherent theory. So that's all the that's all that I'm going to look at is is the second book. Um, Like all my episodes, I am going to read a couple of sections here. And I'll provide some commentary. Um, I'll do my best to simplify some of the things that he says so that they're uh, comprehensible to, you know, a non-economist. And, uh, yeah, so this will be one of those episodes that's probably heavier on the readings. But this is a book that I don't think very many people have read, honestly. It comes up from time to time, but it's not anywhere near as uh, well-known as The Wealth of Nations although it is the most well-known of the protectionist treatises. There are some others, uh, but this is kind of the the main protectionist book. So th- I want to take a look at this one. Maybe I'll get to some of the other ones at some point, but not today. And uh, I'm going to jump right in here, start reading uh, from book two, The Theory, in this Uh, First section, he talks about the difference between different types of uh, economy. I think that over time, this would become known as macro and microeconomics. I don't know, but I suspect that those terms were not in play in 1841. I don't think those terms even existed. Uh, He makes a differentiation between private, political, and cosmopolitical economies. Well, let's let me just jump in here and and you'll see what I'm talking about. He says, quote, 
J.B. Say openly demands that we should imagine the existence of a universal republic in order to comprehend the idea of general free trade. This writer, whose efforts were mainly restricted to the formation of a system out of the materials in which Adam Smith had brought to light, says explicitly in the sixth volume of his Practical Political Economy, We may take into our consideration the economical interests of the family, with the father at its head. The principles and observations referring thereto will constitute private economy. Those principles, however, which have reference to the interests of whole nations, whether in themselves or in relation to other nations, form public economy. Political economy, lastly, relates to the interests of all nations, to human society in general. It must be remarked here that, in the first place, Say recognizes the existence of a national economy or political economy under the name public economy, but that he nowhere treats of the latter in his works. Secondly, that he attributes the name political economy to a doctrine which is evidently of cosmopolitical nature, and that in this doctrine he invariably merely speaks of an economy which has for its sole object the interests of the whole human society, without regard to the separate interests of distinct nations. This substitution of terms might be passed over if, say, after having explained what he calls political economy, which, however, is nothing else but cosmopolitical or worldwide economy or economy of the whole human race, had acquainted us with the principles of the doctrine which he calls public economy, which, however, is, properly speaking, nothing else but the economy of given nations or true political economy. In defining and developing this doctrine, he could scarcely forbear to proceed from the idea and the nature of the nation, and to show what material modifications the economy of the whole human race must undergo by the fact that, at present, that race is still separated into distinct nationalities, each held together by common powers and interests, and distinct from other societies of the same kind which, in the exercise of their natural liberty, are opposed to one another. However, by giving his cosmopolitical economy the name political, he dispenses with this explanation, affects, by means of a transposition of terms, also a transposition of meaning, and thereby masks a series of the gravest theoretical errors. All later writers have participated in this error. Sismondi also calls political economy explicitly the science that takes care of the happiness of the human race. Adam Smith and his followers teach us from this mainly nothing more than what Quesnay and his followers had taught us already for the article of the Systematic Review Treating of the Physiocratic Schools. States, in almost the same words, the well-being of the individual is dependent altogether on the well-being of the whole human race. The first of the North American advocates of free trade, as understood by Adam Smith, Thomas Cooper, president of Columbia College, denies even the existence of nationality. He calls the nation a grammatical invention, created only to save paraphrases, a non-entity, which has no actual existence save in the heads of politicians. Cooper is, moreover, perfectly consistent with respect to this, in fact much more consistent than his predecessors and instructors, for it is evident that as soon as the existence of nations with their distinct nature and interests is recognized, it becomes necessary to modify the economy of human society in accordance with these special interests, and that if Cooper intended to represent these modifications as error, it was very wise on his part from the beginning to disown the very existence of nations. For our own part, we are far from rejecting the theory of cosmopolitical economy as it has been perfected by the prevailing school. We are, however, of opinion that political economy, or as Say calls it, public economy, should also be developed scientifically, and that it is always better to call things by their proper names than to give them significations which stand opposed to the true import of words. If we wish to remain true to the laws of logic, 
and of the nature of things, we must set the economy of individuals against the economy of societies, and discriminate in respect to the latter between true political or national economy, which, emanating from the idea and nature of the nation, teaches how a given nation in the present state of the world and its own special national interests can maintain and improve its economical conditions, and cosmopolitical economy, which originates in the assumption that all nations of the earth form but one society living in a perpetual state of peace. If, as the prevailing school requires, we assume a universal union or confederation of all nations as the guarantee for an everlasting peace, the principle of international free trade seems to be perfectly justified. The less every individual is restrained in pursuing his own individual prosperity, the greater the number and wealth of those with whom he has free intercourse, the greater the area over which his individual activity can exercise itself, the easier it will be for him to utilize, for the increase of his prosperity, the properties given him by nature, the knowledge and talents which he has acquired, and the forces of nature placed at his disposal. As with separate individuals, so is also the case with individual communities, provinces, and countries. A simpleton only could maintain that a union for free commercial intercourse between themselves is not as advantageous to the different states included in the United States of North America, to the various departments of France, and to the various German allied states, as would be their separation by internal provincial customs tariffs. End quote. Okay, so what are we looking at here? He opens up talking about J.B. Say, I believe that's Jean-Baptiste Say, an economist who came after Adam Smith and built upon what Adam Smith uh, had, had written about. Uh, he basically says that Say lays out a couple of different ideas and says that there is a, there's a, like an individual um, private economy and then there is a public economy and then there is political economy and... Uh, Friedrich List says the, wor the wordings that he's using here aren't really accurate. What we should speak of is private economy in so far as you're dealing with a single person or household and how they manage their money. Then you have what should be called political economy, which Jean-Baptiste Say calls public economy, which is the economy of a nation state or a political entity, which is why it should be called political economy. And then uh, what Jean-Baptiste Say calls political economy, which really should be called cosmopolitical economy because this is the management and the study of the global economy, the economy of, economy of the whole human race. And he says, Say doesn't really talk about public economy or, or political economy at all. Uh, he just skips over it and talks about uh, the economy of the human race and calls it political economy. And he says this mistake has been continued ever since then. And so discussion of the economy of a nation is just sort of ignored. We speak of the economy of a person and then we speak of the greater economy of the whole human race. And that dis that missing component of the economy of an individual nation uh, has has set economists down the wrong path. And then he talks about someone ta called Thomas Cooper, uh, who was a, an advocate of free trade in America, who essentially takes it to its logical conclusion and says, the, na the nation state is really just a what we would now call a social construct. It's just a, a notion in the heads of politicians, and it has no real uh, meaning. Uh, but Friedrich List essentially says, we have to study all three of these uh, different economic positions. And in the end there, he, he says basically, you know, he says only a simpleton could maintain that a union for free commercial intercourse between themselves is not as advantageous to the different states included in the United States uh, as would be if they had internal tariffs. So the idea is here, like if you would imagine the United States and the different states that comprise it, and there were customs, duties, and tariffs whenever states traded with one another, um, only a simpleton could say that it's, it's, it would be more effective and more efficient and better for the nation to have all of these tariffs between the states. He 
He says, as a political entity, the United States as a singular nation doesn't want to have tariffs and trade barriers set up between its internal divisions. Um, but the, glo the global economy, the economy of the human race, is not one of a singular political entity. And for that reason, it, couldn't, it shouldn't be understood along those same terms. So let me jump forward here to the next section um, where he begins to talk about uh, the concept of productive power, which is an important part of, uh, of his theory here. And so in this section, he says, quote, the causes of wealth are something totally different from wealth itself. A person may possess wealth, i.e. exchangeable value, if, however, he does not possess the power of producing objects of more value than he consumes, he will become poorer. A person may be poor if he, however, possesses the power of producing a larger amount of valuable articles than he consumes, he becomes rich. The power of producing wealth is therefore infinitely more important than wealth itself. It ensures not only the possession and the increase of what has been gained, but also the replacement of what has been lost. This is still more the case with entire nations who cannot live out of mere rentals than with private individuals. Germany has been devastated in every century by pestilence, by famine, or by civil or foreign wars. She has nevertheless always retained a great portion of her powers of production and has thus quickly reattained some degree of prosperity. While rich and mighty, but despot and priest-ridden Spain, notwithstanding her comparative enjoyment of internal peace, has sunk deeper into poverty and misery. The same sun still shines on the Spaniards. They still possess the same amount of territory. Their minds are still as rich. They are still the same people as before the discovery of America and before the introduction of the Inquisition. But that nation has gradually lost her powers of production and has therefore become poor and miserable. The War of Independence of the United States of America cost that nation hundreds of millions, but her powers of production were immeasurably strengthened by gaining independence. And it was for this reason that in the course of a few years after the peace, she obtained immeasurably greater riches than she had ever possessed before. If we compare the state of France in the year 1809 with that of the year 1839, what a difference in favor of the latter. Nevertheless, France has in the interim lost her sovereignty over a large portion of the European continent. She has suffered two devastating invasions and had to pay millions of money in war contributions and indemnities. It was impossible that so clear an intellect as Adam Smith possessed could altogether ignore the difference between wealth and its causes and the overwhelming influence of these causes on the condition of nations. In the introduction to his work, he says in clear words, in effect, labor forms the fund from which every nation derives its wealth, and the increase of wealth depends on the productive power of labor, namely on the degree of skill, dexterity, and judgment with which the labor of the nation is generally applied, and secondly, on the proportion between the number of those employed productively and the number of those who are not so employed. From this, we see how clearly Smith, in general, perceived that the condition of nations is principally dependent on the sum of their productive powers. It does not, however, appear to be the plan of nature that complete sciences should spring already perfected from the brains of individual thinkers. It is evident that Smith was too exclusively possessed by the cosmopolitical idea of the physiocrats, universal freedom of trade, and by his own great discovery, the division of labor, to follow up the idea of the importance to a nation of its powers of production. However much science may be indebted to him in respect of the remaining parts of his work, the idea division of labor seemed to him his most brilliant thought. It was calculated to secure for his book a name and for himself posthumous fame. End quote. Okay, so what we see here is essentially... Um, well, his opening line that the causes of wealth are totally different from wealth itself. Uh, another line that I want to draw your attention to is when he says, the power of producing wealth is infinitely more important than wealth itself. It ensures not only the possession and the increase of what has been gained, but the replacement of what has been lost. 
and he goes through a few countries. Um, he mentions Germany and Spain. Germany, hanging on to its productive powers, can go through civil strife and conflict and wars and always gets back on its feet because it maintains these productive powers, whereas Spain doesn't have the productive powers. He calls it, uh, it priest-ridden. Um, but he says that it has lost its powers of production and has become poor and miserable. And then he talks about the United States and how um, the United States' powers of production were strengthened by gaining independence, and for that reason, it has obtained immeasurably greater riches uh, than it ever possessed before. So, he, he, he says, Adam Smith sort of recognizes this in like the introduction or in the opening, yeah, the introduction to his work. He, he, he recognizes that, that uh, labor forms the fund from which every nation derives its wealth. Now, it would seem obvious, work creates wealth. Uh, but then he gets so wrapped up in the division of labor, which was his great discovery, that he doesn't put much more thought or effort into that concept. He zeroes in on the division of labor, and he, he writes very intelligently about the division of labor, but uh, he says science doesn't spring forward fully complete from one man's mind. So while Adam Smith kind of put forward this idea, it was incomplete and needed to be developed further and that had not happened uh, by the time that he, that he wrote this. So, um, moving forward from there, uh, he talks a little bit more about this idea of, of productive powers of a nation in this section here, where he says, quote, The prosperity of a nation is not, as Say believes, greater in the proportion in which it has amassed more wealth i.e. values of exchange, but in the proportion in which it has developed its powers of production. Although laws and public institutions do not produce immediate values, they nevertheless produce productive powers. And Say is mistaken if he maintains that nations have been enabled to become wealthy under all forms of government, and that by means of laws no wealth can be created. The foreign trade of a nation must not be estimated in the way in which individual merchants judge it, solely and according to the theory of values, by regarding merely the gain at any particular moment of some material advantage. The nation is bound to keep steadily in view all these conditions on which its present and future existence, prosperity, and power depend. The nation must sacrifice and give up a measure of material prosperity in order to gain culture, skill, and powers of united production. It must sacrifice some present advantages in order to ensure to itself future ones. If, therefore, a manufacturing power developed in all its branches forms a fundamental condition of all higher advances in civilization, material prosperity, and political power in every nation, a fact which we think we have proved from history, if it be true, as we believe we can prove, that in the present conditions of the world, a new, unprotected manufacturing power cannot possibly be raised up under free competition with a power which has long since grown in strength and is protected on its own territory. How can anyone possibly undertake to prove, by arguments, only based on the mere theory of values, that a nation ought to buy its goods like individual merchants, at places where they are to be had the cheapest? That we act foolishly if we manufacture anything at all which can be gotten cheaper from abroad? that we ought to place the industry of the nation at the mercy of the self-interest of individuals, that protective duties constitute monopolies, which are granted to the individual home manufacturers at the expense of the nation. It is true that protective duties at first increased the price of manufactured goods, but it is just as true, and moreover acknowledged by the prevailing economical school, that in the course of time, by the nation being able to build up a completely developed manufacturing power of its own, those goods are produced more cheaply at home than the price at which they can be imported from foreign parts. If, therefore, a sacrifice of value is caused by protective, protective duties, it is made good by the gain of a power of production, which not only secures to the nation an infinitely greater amount of material goods, 
but also industrial independence in case of war. Through industrial independence and the internal prosperity derived from it, the nation obtains the means for successfully carrying on foreign trade and for extending its mercantile marine. It increases its civilization, perfects its institutions internally, and strengthens its external power. A nation capable of developing a manufacturing power, if it makes use of the system of protection, thus acts quite in the same spirit as that landed proprietor did, who by the sacrifice of some material wealth allowed some of his children to learn a productive trade. End quote. So he's basically saying that the, the, the wealth of a nation is not determined by uh, the amount to which it has amassed values of exchange, in other words, money and gold, uh, but instead the, the prosperity of a nation is determined by its powers of production. He says you can't just look at a nation's foreign trade the way a merchant would judge his own foreign trade. The nation, he says, is bound to keep steadily in view the conditions on which its present and future existence, prosperity, and power depend. So the nation has to think about things more than just collecting, collecting money. Um, the nation has other things to think about that are going to keep it uh, strong over the long term. He says, it may be true that protective duties uh, increase the price of manufactured goods at first, uh, that won't last because the uh, manufacturing capacity will be developed within the nation and uh, th inevitably the products produced by the nation will be cheaper than importing products from afar. I'm not so sure uh, that he's correct in that given the differences in labor costs between nations, um, but it's certainly the case that once the, once the industry, once the domestic industry begins to develop, um, the cost of buying domestic goods goes down as the, as the industry becomes more capable and more experienced in producing whatever, whatever goods it's creating. So let's keep moving. He starts to talk a little bit about the division of labor uh, as described by Adam Smith uh, in regards to specifically the, the example of the pin factory. And here he says, quote, the school is indebted to its renowned founder for the discovery of that natural law which it calls division of labor. But neither Adam Smith nor any of his successors have thoroughly investigated its essential nature and character or followed it out to its most important consequences. The expression division of labor is an indefinite one and must necessarily produce a false or indefinite idea. It is division of labor if one savage on one day and on the same day goes hunting or fishing, cuts down wood and repairs his wigwam and prepares arrows, nets and clothes. But it is also division of labor, as Adam Smith mentions as example, 10 different persons share in the different occupations connected with the manufacture of a pin. The former is an objective and the latter is a subjective division of labor. The former hinders, the latter furthers production. The essential difference between both is that in the former instance, one person divides his work so as to produce various objects, while in the latter, several persons share in the production of a single object. Both operations, on the other hand, may be called, with an equal correctness, a union of labor. The savage unites various tasks in his person, while in the case of the pin manufacturer, various persons are united in one work of production in common. The essential character of the natural law from which the popular school explains such important phenomena in social economy is evidently not merely a division of labor, but a division of different commercial operations between several individuals, and at the same time a confederation or union of various energies, intelligences, and powers on behalf of a common production. The cause of the productiveness of these operations is not merely that division, but essentially this union. Adam Smith well perceives this himself when he states, the necessaries of life of the lowest members of society are a product of joint labor and the cooperation of a number of individuals. What a pity that he did not follow out this idea which he so clearly expresses of united labor. 
If we continue to consider the example of the pin manufacturer, adduced by Adam Smith in illustration of the advantages of the division of labor, and seek for the causes of the phenomena that 10 persons united in that manufacture can produce an infinitely larger number of pins than if everyone carried on the entire pin manufacture separately, we find that the division of commercial operations without combination of the productive powers towards one common object could but little further this production. In order to create such a result, the different individuals must cooperate bodily as well as mentally and work together. The one who makes the heads of the pins must be certain of the cooperation of the one who makes the points if he does not want to run the risk of producing pinheads in vain. The labor operations of all must be in proper proportion to one another, and the workmen must live as near to one another as possible, and their cooperation must be ensured. Let us suppose, for example, that every one of these ten workmen lives in a different country. How often might their cooperation be interrupted by wars, interruptions of transport, commercial crises, etc.? How greatly would the cost of the product be increased, and consequently the advantage of the division of operation diminished? And would not the separation or secession of a single person from the union throw all the others out of work? The popular school, because it has regarded the division of operation alone as the essence of this natural law, has committed the error of applying it merely to the separate manufactory or farm. It has not perceived that the same law extends its action especially over the whole manufacturing and agricultural power, over the whole economy of the nation. As the pin manufactory only prospers by the confederation of the productive force of the individuals, so does every kind of manufacture prosper only by the confederation of its productive forces with those of other kinds of manufacture. For the success of a machine manufactory, for instance, it is necessary that the mines and metalworks should furnish it with the necessary materials, and that all the hundred different sorts of manufactories which require machines should buy their products from it. Without machine manufactories, a nation would, in time of war, be exposed to the danger of losing the greater portion of its manufacturing power. In like manner, the entire manufacturing industry of a state, in connection with its agricultural interest, and the latter in connection with the former, will prosper the more the nearer they are placed to one another, and the less they are interrupted in their mutual exchanges with one another. The advantages of their confederation under one and the same political power in times of war of national differences, of commercial crises, failure of crops, etc., are not less perceptible than are the advantages of the union of the persons belonging to a pin manufactory under one in the same roof. End quote. So I think this is an interesting section here because he says, so imagine you have a pin factory like Adam Smith talks about, and on the one hand, you know, you might have 10 people and each one of them is making pins on their own. The whole process, they make the pin head, they measure the length of the pin, they sharpen the pin, and whatever other processes are involved in making pins, maybe packaging the pins, what have you. Rather than have each person at his own little workstation doing the whole series, the division of labor would be one person just makes the pin heads, one person just measures the pin length, one person cuts it, one person sharpens it, you know, whatever. Each person has a role to play, and when each person is specialized like this, uh, they can make many more pins than they would be able to make if each one was sitting at a workstation producing pins all by himself. This is the division of labor, and this is an important part of Adam Smith's theory. But the other half of it is the union of labor, as Friedrich List calls it, which is that the presumption here is that all of these people are working together to make pins. And uh, the person who's making the pinheads has to trust that the other people are going to want to use the pinheads that he has created. He has to be certain that, there are, that the whole thing is a confeder confederation of workers who are united in the task of producing the pins. And if you had each of these 10 people, rather than sitting in a factory together, if each one of them was in a different country and the person who made pinheads was shipping them off somewhere else to have them assembled, uh, it would be 
the whole pin making operation would be susceptible to all of these various problems war disruptions in trade whatever it may be you know blockades whatever the the cause is various things can disrupt their capacity um and if one person should decide not to do their job or get fired and they can't or find a person a replacement the whole system is is thrown askew and so the whole thing doesn't just work because all the people have divided up their tasks it also works just as much because all of the people have decided to cooperate with one another and and then here i want to draw your attention to this where he says he says as the pin manufactory only prospers by the confederation of the productive force of the individuals so does every kind of manufacture prosper only by the confederation of its productive forces with those of all other kinds of manufacture for the success of a machine manufactory it's necessary that mines and metalworks should furnish it and that people should buy it etc cetera, etc cetera. so each industry has to be able to 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 trust that it's able to engage with the other industries so that the people who make pins have to be able to trust that they're going to be able to buy shoes from the shoemaker they they forego their shoemaking just like the person who's making pinheads foregoes the other pin making tasks lets somebody else do them but he trusts that somebody is going to be there doing them and that he's going to be able to pass the pinhead on to the next guy in line who's going to do the next task likewise the the different components of the nation have to trust that the other components of the nation are going to uh work together and engage in commerce in order to make sure that everybody in the pin factory has shoes on uh make sure that each um you know the people who are producing steel the people who are doing this that and the other the people who are growing corn and so on and so forth trust that there are will be other people who are um willing to engage in trade with them to be able to make sure that all all the various things that ha- have to happen in the nation are all being under undertaken uh so let's move on from there where he he uh begins to talk a bit about the difference between the private and the uh and the political economy so here he says quote we have now to demonstrate how the popular school has concealed its misunderstanding of the national interests and of the effects of national union of powers by confounding the principles of private economy with those of national economy what is prudence in the conduct of every private family says adam smith can scarce be folly in that of a great kingdom every individual in pursuing his own interests necessarily promotes thereby also the interests of the community it is evident that every individual inasmuch as he knows his own local circumstances best and pays most attention to his occupation is far better able to judge than the statesman or legislator how his capital can most profitably be invested he who would venture to give advice to the people how to invest their capital would not merely take it upon himself a useless task but would also assume to himself an authority which belongs solely to the producer and which can be entrusted to those persons least of all who consider themselves equal to so difficult a task adam smith concludes from this restrictions on trade imposed on the behalf of the internal industry of a country are mere folly every nation like every individual ought to buy articles where they can be procured the cheapest in order to attain to the highest degree of national prosperity we have simply to follow the maxim of letting things alone smith and say compare a nation which seeks to promote its industry by protective duties to a tailor who wants to make his own boots and to a bootmaker who would impose a toll on those who enter his door in order to promote his prosperity as in all errors of the popular school so also in this one does thomas cooper go to extremes in his book which is directed against the american system of protection political economy he alleges is almost synonymous with the private economy of all individuals politics are no essential ingredient of political economy 
it is folly to suppose that the community is something quite different from the individuals of which it is composed. Every individual knows best how to invest his labor and his capital. The wealth of the community is nothing else than the aggregate of the wealth of all its individual members. And if every individual can provide best for himself, that nation must be the richest in which every individual is most left to himself. The adherents of the American system of protection had opposed themselves to this argument, which had formerly been adduced by importing merchants in favor of free trade. The American navigation laws had greatly increased the carrying trade, the foreign commerce, and fisheries of the United States, and for the mere protection of their mercantile marine, millions had been annually expended on their fleet. According to his theory, those laws and this expense would be as reprehensible as protective duties. In any case, exclaims Mr. Cooper, no commerce by sea is worth a naval war. The merchants may be left to protect themselves. Thus, the popular school, which had begun by ignoring the principles of nationality and national interests, finally come to the point of altogether denying their existence, and of leaving individuals to defend themselves as they may solely by their own individual powers. How is the wisdom of private economy also wisdom in national economy? Is it in the nature of individuals to take into consideration the want of future centuries, as those concern the nature of the nation and the state? Let us consider only the first beginning of an American town. Every individual left to himself would care merely for his own wants, or at the most those of his nearest successors. Whereas all individuals united in one community provide for the convenience and the wants of the most distant generations. They subject the present generation for this objective to privations and sacrifices, which no reasonable person could expect from individuals. Can the individual further take into consideration in promoting his private economy the defense of the country, public security, and the thousand other objects which can only be attained by the aid of the community? Does not the state require individuals to limit their private liberty according to what those objects require? Does it not even require that they should sacrifice for these some part of their earnings, of their mental and bodily labor, nay, even their own life? We must first root out, as Cooper does, the very ideas of state and nation before this opinion can be entertained. No, that may be wisdom in national economy, which would be folly in private economy, and vice versa. And owing to this very simple reason, that a tailor is no nation, and a nation no tailor, that one family is something very different from a community of millions of families, that one house is something very different from a large national territory. Nor does the individual, merely by understanding his own interests best and by striving to further them, if left to his own devices, always further the interests of the community." End quote. So he's really attacking the idea here that a, an individual person um, doing what's best for themselves is always and automatically going to result through the invisible hand in that which is best for the community. Now, it may be that what results is the most efficient thing, the most efficient way of producing things, the most efficient way of generating wealth. But each individual, in pursuit of their own self-interest, isn't necessarily going to look forward Multi multiple generations into the future or, or even just consider what is best for the nation. It's, it's sort of a, like a bel belief in magic to think that all people ad acting in their own interests, in their own self-interest, is all the time going to create what is also magically in the best inter interests of the nation. Um, that's, that's not entirely true. Now, the invisible hand may set prices to achieve an equilibrium, and I think that's really where the invisible hand can be, can be trusted, that it will 
push prices up or down. It will increase supply or demand. It will decrease supply or demand. According to the prices, there will be a, 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 fluctuating, a fluctuation of activity in order to make sure that needs get met. If a need goes unmet, then, oh, there might be profit in that. People would pay to have that need met. And so things get done through this self-interest. And, you know, as Adam Smith says, it's not the, it's not the uh, benevolence of the baker that causes him to get up every morning and bake bread. It's not because he wants to make sure that everybody has bread to eat. He gets up in the morning and bakes bread because he needs to make money. And so his self-interest is why he bakes the bread. And it just happens to be the case that other people are able to get bread because he's put it on himself to make that bread. But it's his self-interest that drives him to do it. This idea of the invisible hand is worth something, but it's not a silver bullet that says everybody acting in their own interests is always and at all times going to create the situation that is the most ideal for the nation. That's, that's taking it too far. And so he says, you know, a tailor is not a nation. Uh, a house is not a territory. They're not the same thing, and they shouldn't be treated in t as if they are entirely the same. Uh, so let me just keep moving on here a little bit. I've got one last section that I want to read when he talks a little bit about nations, nationhood. He says, quote, the system of the school suffers, as we have already shown, from three main defects. Firstly, from boundless cosmopolitanism, which neither recognizes the principle of nationality nor takes into consideration the satisfaction of its interests. Secondly, from a dead materialism, which everywhere regards chiefly the mere exchangeable value of things, without taking into consideration the mental and political the present and the future interests, and the productive powers of the nation. Thirdly, from a disorganizing particularism and individualism, which, ignoring the nature and character of social labor and the operation of the union of powers in their higher consequences, considers private industry only as it would develop itself under a state of free interchange with society, i.e. with the whole human race were that race not divided into separate national societies. Between each individual and entire humanity, however, stands the nation, with its special language and literature, with its peculiar origin and history, with its special manners and customs, laws and institutions, with the claims of all these for existence, independence, perfection, and continuance for the future and with its separate territory, a society which, united by a thousand ties of mind and of interests, combines itself into one independent whole, which recognizes the law of right for and within itself, and in its united character is still opposed to other societies of a similar kind in their national liberty, and consequently can only, under the existing conditions of the world, maintain self-existence and independence by its own power and resources. As the individual chiefly obtains, by means of the nation and in the nation, mental culture, power of production, security and prosperity, so is the civilization of the human race only conceivable and possible by means of the civilization and development of the individual nations. Meanwhile, however, an infinite difference exists in the condition and circumstance of the various nations, we observe among them giants and dwarfs, well-formed bodies and cripples, civilized, half-civilized, and barbarous nations. But in all of them, as in the individual human being, exists the impulse of self-preservation, the striving for improvement which is implanted by nature. It is the task of politics to civilize the barbarous nationalities, to make the small and weak ones great and strong, but above all, to secure to them existence and continuance. It is the task of national economy to accomplish the economical development of the nation and to prepare it for admission into the universal society of the future. A nation, in its normal state, possesses one common language and literature, a territory endowed with manifold natural resources, extensive, 
and with convenient frontiers and a numerous population. Agriculture, manufactures, commerce, and navigation must all be developed in it proportionately. Arts and sciences, educational establishments, and universal cultivation must stand in it on an equal footing with material production. Its constitution, laws, and institutions must afford to those who belong to it a high degree of security and liberty, and must promote religion, morality, and prosperity. In a word, must have the well-being of its citizens as their object. It must possess sufficient power on land and at sea to defend its independence and to protect its foreign commerce. It will possess the power of beneficially affecting the civilization of less advanced nations, and by means of its own surplus population and of their mental and material capital, to found colonies and beget new nations. A large population and an extensive territory endowed with manifold national resources are essential requirements of the normal nationality. They are the fundamental conditions of mental cultivation as well as of material development and political power. A nation restricted in the number of its population and in territory, especially if it has a separate language, can only possess a crippled literature, crippled institutions for promoting art and science. A small state can never bring to complete perfection within its territory the various branches of production. In it, all protection becomes mere private monopoly. Only through alliances with more powerful nations, by partly sacrificing the advantages of nationality and by excessive energy, can it maintain with difficulty its independence. A nation which possesses no coasts, mercantile marine, or naval power, or has not under its dominion and control the mouths of its rivers, is in its foreign commerce dependent on other countries. It can never establish colonies of its own, nor form new nations. All surplus population, mental and material means which flows from such nation to uncultivated countries is lost to its own literature, civilization, and industry, and goes to the benefit of other nationalities. End quote. Uh, so there's not too much to say about that section. He just kind of talks about how there's really a whole array of things that need to be taken into consideration for the, uh, for the success and prosperity of a nation. Uh, but I just think it's a nice, a nice line here where he says, Between each individual and entire humanity stands the nation with its special language and literature, etc., etc., I'm not going to go into any more detail about that last section. It's really just sort of self-explanatory. Self -explanatory. Um, I thank you very much for listening, and I think I'm just going to wrap it up there. Important book if you're interested in protectionism. This is really the uh, one of the most important protectionist uh, uh, treatises that has ever been written. Uh, but like I said, and like you probably gathered from the readings, it's a little archaic. It's a little old-fashioned. It uh, doesn't really discuss some of the things that uh, are discussed in, in modern economics. Uh, so in that sense, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but it certainly gives some good and important ideas uh, that can be used in further development of protectionist theory. So uh, it's important to have this on your shelf if that's something you're interested in. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Goodbye.